Hey, this is Dave. Welcome back to OC Astronomy. We're going to take a quick look at chapter 11, which talks about the gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. A lot of what we know about these gas giants comes from probes that have been sent out there. Um, the earliest ones were called the Pioneer Probe. The Pioneer 10 and 11 probes were the first to get to Jupiter, and then uh, Pioneer 10 even flew on to Saturn, and, and they were able to, to find out some stuff by, by uh, flybys as they, as they went by the planet. Um, then later, the, Jupiter, or the, uh, the Voyager spacecraft, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, were sent on special trajectories that sent them by Ju uh, Jupiter, and then past all the other uh, gas giants, and they were able to learn a lot. And now, actually, uh, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 ha were, were kind of boomeranged out into the uh, past the solar system, and they think that Voyager 1 has finally reached the actual edge of the boundary of where the, uh, the solar system actually ends. Um, it's the farthest things away. Uh, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 are the farthest things away from Earth um, that are man-made. Um, they're flying really, really fast, but some of them are they're still sending back uh, radio signals every now and then, so we know that they're actually still alive, which is pretty amazing. Uh, Voyager 1 even took, uh, and they actually took a golden record. They put a record just like you'd find a vinyl record album, and they put a, a stylus and a record player inside the thing, and they actually were able to encode pictures uh, with the sound waves, just like they encode them to send for TV broadcasts. And they were able to encode those pictures and they put on there on a plaque kind of a way to decode those signals. And the thinking was that if that probe is ever found by an intelligent life form, uh, that by somehow figuring out the stuff that's on the plaque, realizing what the golden record is and the stylus that's able to play it on the record player, that they could actually hear sounds from Earth and uh, uh, music from Earth, and also they could decode some of those sound waves to, that, we, that we sent pictures, and they could actually f see pictures of things that are on Earth, which is really, really interesting. They were pictures of things like a woman holding a child, uh, a grown man and woman and family, uh, trees, uh, the traffic and buildings of New York City and things that show Earth like it was in the 70s. You got to admire the 70s. It was a groovy time. They, they did a lot. Um, but the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 were sent out into space. And maybe one of these days, uh, somebody will find them. Who knows? Um, later on, the Galileo space probe was, was sent to Jupiter. Galileo was the first person to ever look at, through a telescope and to see the moons around Jupiter. And so they named that probe in his honor. And one of the things that it did was... It sent off a probe that, that really quickly skimmed into the surface of Jupiter. Um, and while it was still alive before it burnt up, it was able to send back a lot of data to the probe, uh, to, to the Galileo main uh, mothership, if you want to call it. And then the mothership was able to send back the, that information uh, to Earth. And from that, we've learned that the, the atmosphere of Jupiter is about 75% hydrogen and 24% helium, which is about the same as they believe that most stars are. And actually, um, as we know, a lot of the stars that are in the sky are, when you see them out in the sky, you're actually looking at binary stars. There are, there's a majority of the stars that we see are binary. And if Jupiter, <laughs> voice crack, and if Jupiter was uh, a bit bigger than it is, it would have been a star. And it would have been a binary, we would have had a binary system just like all the other stars that we're familiar with. Um, and so the, the thing is, though, it didn't, it didn't collect enough gas to become uh, dense enough to, to have the gravity push together the core of it and start fusion in the core of Jupiter. Um, it's still really hot because of gravity in the core of Jupiter, but it hasn't kicked off fusion uh, because it never had quite enough mass. Um, the mass of all the gas giants is mostly hydrogen and helium, and there's a little bit of methane and ammonia uh, ice particles, uh, some water ice particles, um, and, and smaller seeds and things like that in the atmosphere, but most of it is those gases. Um, what would happen if you were to try to step on to the surface of Jupiter that we could see through telescopes? Well, it's just a gas, and so you would plunge through, 
And what's interesting is, let's say that you had a spacesuit on. If you had a spacesuit on and you were able to plunge through and it protected you from the heat of Jupiter, eventually you would find a part of that gas that's around there that's about as dense as water. And it's still gas in a shell and it's not like raining. It's just a layer of gas that's about as thick as water. And that's about as thick as your body is. And so the gravity would actually hold you there and you would just be plunging. You'd, you'd be like swimming in that atmosphere layer of water and you'd be bobbing up and down as a little astronaut bob. You, you would never actually touch the surface of Jupiter uh, because uh, you would be buoyant and your buoyancy would hold you in that little zone. Of course, you would get really, really hot and you'd probably die. And it's awfully hard to eat a pudding cup with the, you know, or whatever your snack of choice is. If, you know, the shield keeps getting in the way, you can't get a spoon. Anyway, um, so if you were an astronaut, you would probably plunge down and wind up floating somewhere in the middle of the atmosphere of Jupiter, which is kind of interesting. Um, Uranus is a special guy uh, because Uranus is tilted over on its side. All the other planets in the, well, the, the planets that are around the sun go in a, uh, like a, a horizontal orbit when compared to the sun. But Jupiter, I mean, uh, sorry, Uranus rolls around. So as it goes around the sun, it actually rolls sideways. Now it's interesting because it rolls like this. So for most of the year, the North Pole is, is facing it, and then its equator is facing it. And then its south pole is facing it, and then its equator is facing it. So it, it doesn't like turn or anything. It tumbles around like this, and so it, it kind of has a really weird uh, orientation. They think that that's probably because uh, Uranus was actually hit by something maybe Earth-sized as, as another planet hit it, and it caused it to wobble. And by the time that it settled down, it settled down into a rolling orbit instead of a rotating orbit like this. So Uranus is kind of weird. Also, um, all the gas giant planets, uh, you're really, really probably familiar with, with Saturn having a ring around it because Saturn's ring is really prominent and you can see it. Actually, though, all of the gas giants have rings around them, even Jupiter. Jupiter has a ring, uh, you get a ring, and you get a ring, and Uranus gets a ring, and Neptune gets a ring. They all got rings. But because Uranus is tilted over on its side, its ring is actually like this. It's, if you're looking at it, it's face on. So instead of it being around like this with Saturn, it's actually uh, face onto you like so. It's kind of a weird looking setup. Um, so Uranus is kind of strange. Then um, Uranus also has something... Science, or observers noticed that it was being pulled towards Jupiter as it got towards Jupiter, but that something else was pulling it out. And they couldn't figure out what might be pulling it out. And they call this gravitational perturbations. So gravity was perturbing the orbit of Uranus and making it go close to Jupiter, but then it was also being pulled back out. And because of this, uh, an astronomer named, a French astronomer named Le Verrier actually was able to calculate where you might find an object that is big enough to pull Uranus back out. And they were able to look in that area of the sky. And amazingly, they found the planet Neptune based on the calculations of Le Verrier. So it's kind of an interesting story. That planet, The planet Uranus was found with a telescope. And then, uh, then the planet Neptune was found using mathematics. So that, that's an interesting story that's in that chapter. Also, the last thing is the reason why uh, Saturn's rings look so prominent. Why is that? Its rings look really prominent because they think that a, a, a pretty large sized comet went too close to Saturn. And as the comet was going around Saturn or as it was flying by, it was caught in its gravity. And there's something called the Roche limit. Uh, R-O-C-H-E, I think, Roche limit. It was named after a, the guy who figured it out. But basically, if you get too close, if, if an object like a moon gets too close to its host planet, the tidal forces can actually rip it apart. So what they think happened is a, uh, a comet got pulled into the orbit of Saturn, and it was going around and around, but it got too close to Saturn, and it being a comet and being kind of loosely held together, it got inside that roach limit and then the tidal forces pulled it apart. And as it pulled it apart, it spread out the ice particles. And what they know now is that Saturn's rings are almost certainly composed of water ice. Um, so it's kind of unique. But because the water ice crystals are really uh, uh, clear and shiny, 
when the sunlight hits them, they really stand out. And so Saturn's rings really stand out a lot brighter to us than the rings of uh, Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune. Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune's rings are probably formed of smaller bodies like asteroids and maybe even comets also, but they're far enough away where they haven't broken up. And so they have a bunch of little tiny moons, um, but they've been pulled together by Jupiter and those larger planets' gravity. But Saturn's the one that got pulled close to it broke inside the roach limit and got torn apart by the gravity. So there you go. There's a little bit of, uh, of information about the gas giants. Um, they think that uh, they formed whenever the inner planet or the inner planets probably might have had a lot more hydrogen and helium around them. But once the sun kicked off on fusion and you started getting solar radiation coming out, that it basically blew all those particles of hydrogen and helium out into the outer atmosphere. And then they kind of condensed around those bigger objects. The first one that it would have had a chance to condense around was Jupiter. And Jupiter's mass is gigantic compared to all the other ones. Uh, Jupiter has like... I think it accounts for nine-tenths of the mass of all the planets. So it's quite a bit bigger than all the rest of the planets combined. And again, if Jupiter had been just a little bit bigger, we'd have been a binary system instead of just having one star. We would have had two. Um, so there you go. There's a little bit about the gas giants. That's chapter 11. I hope you are doing good, and I hope you have fun on the quiz.